service. Bethel, our Mumford campus, is located at 25 North Tipton Street in the heart of downtown Mumford, Tennessee, and our Memphis campus is located at 2216 Whitney Avenue in the Fraser community of Memphis. It's my pleasure and privilege to come to you today live from the auditorium of our Mumford campus. The Lord has blessed us here in the city of Mumford. The Lord led us to this area in 2011. And this earlier this year, we were blessed to pay this facility off. And the Lord saying the same in the fall, we will officially burn the mortgage here at our Mumford campus. Due to the COVID-19 outbreak, we are not practicing spiritual distancing, but we are practicing social distancing. And so we're coming to you via Facebook, and I trust that you would like us, that you would share this page, that share this service, and invite others to be a part of our Palm Sunday celebration. This coming Tuesday night, I will continue our Bible study at 7 p.m. Central, What Love Looks Like, from 1 Corinthians 13. So I trust again that you will join us on Facebook for our time of study and sharing the Word of God. I'm going to be sharing a Palm Sunday message with you. Get your Bibles. We're going to be going to the book of the, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. Let's pray. Father, we honor you today for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for the privilege you've given to us to be able to reach and to remain connected to our Bethel Church family. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to connect and reach even a, large, a larger audience. And so we pray your blessings today upon this time of sharing the word of God. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, let it be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, you are my strength, and Father, you are my redeemer. In Jesus' name we do pray, thank God, amen, amen. Let's go to the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 11. <clears throat> to begin reading at verse at verse 1 the Bible says as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it you will find a coat tied there, which no one has ever written. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you doing this, tell them the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. Verse 4, then they went and found a coat outside in the street and tied tied at a doorway as they united as pardon me as they untied it some people standing there asked what are you doing untying that coat they answered as Jesus had told them to and the people let them go when they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it he sat on it many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And the word of God is blessed. Mark's account of Jesus' last week 
That's what I want to talk about this morning, the last week. Mark's account of Jesus' last week on earth begins with chapter 11. Although his gospel does not end until chapter 16, one third of Mark's gospel would be omitted if he had ended with Palm Sunday. One third of Mark's gospel discusses the events that took place between Palm Sunday and Easter. And so Mark provides a unique timeline of the events of the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry beginning with Palm Sunday. In our text, it is during Palm Sunday that the Jews would come from the ends of the earth to Jerusalem. It was during Passover that they would come from the ends of the earth to Jerusalem to celebrate this wonderful feast. And wherever Jews lived, it was their ambition, it was their custom, it was their desire to observe at least one Passover in Jerusalem. The gospel writer Mark, unlike the other three gospel writers, he tells of two processionals that entered Jerusalem on the same day at the same time. One of which, Jesus, who was riding a colt and who was being celebrated. The second processional contains Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, coming to ensure that there would be no trouble during the Passover. Jesus' procession was a peasant procession representing the have-nots while Pilate's procession, procession was an imperial one representing those who have. Jesus' procession proclaimed the kingdom of God, while Pilate's procession proclaimed the power of the empire. The fact that both processionals arrived in Jerusalem simultaneously is by no means an accident. Scholars believe that the arrivals were prearranged by Jesus himself, and he did so early in advance. I tend to agree with this theory based on my own knowledge of the Bible. For if you recall, prior to Jesus' entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he had just left the nearby town of Bethany, where he raised his dear friend Lazarus from the dead. It could be suggested that Jesus' delay in getting to Lazarus when he was first informed of his dear friend's illness was more than just to prove that he himself, Jesus, was the resurrection. However, it could also be suggested that Jesus' delay was to ensure that he would enter the city of Jerusalem precisely at the time that Pontius Pilate arrived so that Pontius Pilate himself might also witness the praises of the multitude as they shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And to prove that he was not afraid of death, and to prove that he was not afraid of the powers that be, Jesus, 
in what would be considered a radical move. He entered into the city by day, not by night, but he entered by day with the cheers and celebration of the multitude as they waved palm branches in the air and shouted Hosanna and literally spread them in the middle of the road. Matthew's gospel tells us that there was so much rejoicing that the whole city moved. John in his gospel says to us that the Pharisees expressed dismay, remarking that the whole world had gone after him. And so Mark in his gospel, he tells us that Palm Sunday was by no means Jesus's greatest hour. For you see, if we, if everybody remained with Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem with the praises of the multitude, we would believe that Palm Sunday was Jesus's greatest hour. We would believe that the crowds that shouted Hosanna remained with him. But as we go by a day-by-day -day account from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Day, we discover that Palm Sunday by no means was Jesus' greatest hour. The last week, a man of Jesus, a man where Mark contributes one-third of his gospel, Palm Sunday was only the beginning. Mark makes it easy for us to follow the day-by-day -day account of the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry by using phrases such as on the following day, by using phrases or words such as in the morning. It was two days before Passover. Or perhaps the first day of unleavened bread. He used phrases such as soon as it was morning, the Sabbath, and on the first day of the week. So as we follow Mark's account, as he uses these particular phrases, it is easy for us to identify the day-by-day -day account of Jesus' last week of earthly ministry. Mark points out that it was on Monday when the fig tree was cursed. For what reason? For not producing fruit. And this is a symbolic story that we should apply to our own lives as believers of the word of God. What happens to us when we are not fruitful? Why is it that we look fruitful from afar, but when people approach us looking for hope and looking to be spiritually fed and looking for a word of encouragement, that they find nothing but leaves. They find no spiritual fruit on us at all. All they find is gossip. All they find, a man, is uh, us full of ourselves. We possess nothing that is edifying to the body of Christ. It was on Tuesday that we learned from Mark that Jesus silences those who thought that they could entrap Jesus with questions about paying tribute to Caesar. Notice what Jesus says. He says, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's and give to God that which belongs to God. Allow me to raise this question to you 
on this Palm Sunday? Are you taking from God what rightfully belongs to him and giving it to another? Are you keeping for yourself that which rightfully belongs to God? Well, it was on Wednesday where Mark reveals to us the need of a traitor. Oh, I know you don't like the idea of having a traitor, but Mark makes it clear that everybody needs a traitor. A traitor helps us put in perspective who our real friends are. A traitor helps us to discover who we can really depend on when we're down. A traitor produces a prayer life within us that we would not ordinarily have. The chief priests and others in the elite class, they wanted and needed to stop Jesus. But Mark tells us that they dare not openly arrest him because of the crowd. Mark continually stresses the failure of the disciples to understand that Jesus is going to his death. They expect Jesus to establish an earthly kingdom and they squabble among themselves for positions. And this too is an indictment against those of us who follow Jesus. Amen. We fight for power and we fight for control. We want special positions and special seats. Amen. That suggests we have influence. But you might ask, where is the Judas in all of this? Judas, so he thinks, maintains a secret agenda on Wednesday. But thanks be unto God, God knows everything and God knows all. Unlike Matthew and John, Mark does not give Judas a lot of play in his gospel. He does not talk a lot about Judas in his writing. He does not talk a lot about a man, the acts and the events of Judas. This says to me that Judas should not be the greatest part of your testimony. This says to me that we should not, amen, be telling God about so much about our Judas, amen, as we should be telling God, rather we should not tell God so much about our Judas, but tell Judas about our God, amen. Judas should never be the focal point of your life story. Amen. There are only two references made of Judas in the Gospel of Mark. Mark simply records Jesus as having said in chapter 10, verses 34 and 33, And the Son of Man will be betrayed by the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. But three days later, he'll rise again. The second reference, he only mentions Judas by name. Much later in the 14th chapter and verse 10, Mark says, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. This passage of scripture is also an indictment against those of us in the church. I want you to know that people in the church will sell you out. It breaks your heart, but it's true. People in the church will sell you out. Amen. We will follow you and appear to support you, but we'll sell you out. Amen. We'll eat at your table and sell you out at the same time. Amen. We will know for certain 
that you are a person of good will, of a good heart, of good intentions, but we'll sell you out. Amen. We will go as far as greeting you with a kiss, but sell you out. Always remember that you can only be sold out by those from within. I'm going to say it one more time. Always remember that you can only be sold out by those from within. The psalmist describes his traitor with these words, for it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me, that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and we walked unto the house of God in company. So you can never be sold out by folk on the outside, but you will always be sold out by those from within. It was on the first day of unleavened bread. It was on Thursday that Mark not only takes us to the Last Supper, but he takes us to the Garden of Gethsemane to hear Jesus pray his prayer and witness his arrest. Amen. Jesus says that all will desert him, but Peter vows that he himself would never desert the Lord. Jesus asked three of his closest disciples to watch while he prays, but they all fell asleep. Mark teaches us not to be surprised when those closest to us disappoint us. Jesus prays for deliverance from the coming danger, but it was not God's will for him to be delivered from the coming danger. Jesus was to suffer and he was to die for mankind. Jesus, ask yourself, are you willing to accept God's plan for your life? Are you willing to accept God's will for your life? Are you willing to humble yourself under the hand of the Almighty? Amen. That you might be exalted in due time. Amen. Mark continues the journey of the last week by saying soon as it was morning. Referring to Friday morning. Friday was the day of suffering. Friday was the day of death. Mark, unlike the other gospel writers, he gives precise times in three-hour intervals, beginning at dawn, from 6 a.m. until 9 a.m. Jesus was tortured from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Jesus was humiliated from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. He was taunted at the hands of the soldiers. But from 9 a.m. to noon, Jesus was taken to Calvary where he was crucified. Between the hours of 3 and 6, he died a slow death. He died a painful death. Between the hours of three and six, the gap between God and man had been bridged. Between the hours of three and six, direct access to God had been granted to man. The veil had been rent and the wall, the partition had been taken down. Mark further informs us that the only witness of the crucifixion were the faithful and dedicated women. The men were nowhere to be found. The men were off afraid and running. It was only the women 
that were willing to carry the story of the crucifixion. And finally, on Friday, beginning at 6 p.m., Mark gives the story of the burial of Jesus. Friday is the start of the Sabbath. Therefore, the body of the Jew had to be buried. You see, under normal circumstances, the body of one who had died on the cross was left for the buzzards and left for the animals of the wild. But this was not an ordinary crucifixion. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth upon him should not perish but have everlasting life. This was not an ordinary crucifixion for he was hung up for our hang-ups. This was not an ordinary crucifixion for he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. A man notice that Saturday was the Sabbath. It was on the day of rest. And in Mark 15 and 42, a man, Mark uses the word day before the day of Sabbath. And in Mark 16, he uses the word when the Sabbath had passed. What are you saying? I'm saying that Mark has nothing recorded about the events on Saturday. A man, Mark, has nothing to say at all. According to the Apostles' Creed, after the death of Jesus, Jesus descended into hell. But Mark does not mention anything about Jesus going into hell. Mark teaches that there is another chapter beyond the crucifixion and burial. It is a chapter of vindication. It is a chapter of resurrection. And I want you to know today that there is another chapter beyond your pain. There's another chapter beyond your heartache. There's another chapter beyond your sickness. It's a chapter of victory over death. Victory over sin. Victory over death, hell, and the grave. Resurrection. Palm Sunday, pardon me, was not Jesus' greatest hour. Mark carries us from Palm Sunday to the Sabbath. He has something to say about every day, but when he gets to Saturday, he's silent. I want you to join me next Sunday to hear what Mark has to say about resurrection. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. My brother, my sister, this is not how the story ends for you. The devil would like to put all of us in a long, dark cave of depression. He wants to bring upon us a spirit of affliction within our bodies, but this is not how the story ends for many of the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivereth us from every last one of them. I want you to know that the pain, the hurt, the disappointment that you are experiencing today is not how the story ends. There's another chapter. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, they're thoughts of peace. And that word peace is translated to mean more than conflict. Translated to mean more than the absence of conflict. But that word peace 
It means success in every area of your life. For I have thoughts of peace. I have thoughts of success concerning you. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you for your goodness today. I want to thank you for your mercy. Hallelujah. And I pray that you let your anointing from heaven fall upon us today. God, I ask by the power of the Holy Ghost that you stretch forth your hand even now while we pray. Touch. Make ways, open doors. I thank you, God, because I'm not the only one that can testify that you are a need meter. Ah, wonderful Jesus. I want to thank you for meeting the needs of your people. In the mighty name of Jesus, touch and deliver, touch and make whole, touch and give strength. Stretch forth your hand now, touch while we wait, touch while we call on you, touch while we look to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, save the soul that's nearest hell today. Forgive sin. Forgive sin, forgive sin. In the name of Jesus. And I want to thank you, the Lord, because so much of what we know about the gospel revolves around this last week, holy week. We give ourselves to you this week. We ask more of you and less of ourselves on this week. We look to the cross on this week. In the name of Jesus, thank you, God. Amen. Amen. The gospel reads and the Psalms read in 116 and verse 12. What shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits? Living Bible trend hashtag Bethel one in two. You can use that cash tag. Perhaps these three convenient methods for others may not be the best way for you. You can also mail your donation to P.O. Box 1200, Mumford, Tennessee. Zip 38058. That's P.O. Box 1200, Munford, Tennessee. Zip 38058. The three electronic forms of giving you can give by debit or by credit. And I want to thank you in advance for your giving and supporting this ministry. Thank you for the gifts that were donated on last week. You did a tremendous job, Bethel. I want to thank you. And to our friends that are on Facebook, we invite you to also support this ministry. I'm looking forward to being with you next Sunday. The Lord saying the same. We're going to have a special guest artist with us. I'm not going to tell you who it is. You got to tune in on next Sunday to see who that guest artist will be. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're going to be blessed by the word and blessed by the artists. I think that's all. Let's pray. And now by the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Ghost, rest, rule, and abide with each and every one. And we all sit together.